All right, great. Thank you so much for the invitation to present today. I'm really honored to present on behalf of the Australia Discovery Team for Anglo-American. I'm gonna be talking about some geological insights from our Mount Isa South project located down near Boulia. Before I begin, I have my name on this presentation, but really this is representing the work of a really big team. And I wanna first acknowledge the core members of the Anglo-American Australia Discovery Team our manager, Dave Wood, also Jamin Crystal, our geophysicist, uh, Cam Jala, who's in the audience here today, Ira Friedman, who's in the audience here today, and Dan Sterling. Oh, something wrong? One moment, more technical difficulties. These hybrid conferences are always a challenge. All good now? Okay, let me go back. And I believe that uh, Dan and Dave are joining us online. So any particularly difficult uh, questions I might direct to some of my other teammates who are here online. I also wanna acknowledge some academic collaborators at Curtin University and Australia National University. They worked with, with us on the geochronology, which turned out to be a super important tool for our exploration program. And I wanna highlight as well that we've actually gotten permission from Anglo. We've submitted a publication that contains all the geochronology. It's currently under review at Precambrian Geology, so watch out for that. That should be coming out in the coming months. And last but not least, I really wanna thank Rowena Duckworth from Mintex Petrological Solutions. Um, she does some really great petrology work. And again, we found that really valuable as we worked on our exploration projects, including Mount Isa South. What I've included in this talk today is a bit of regional context. I'm gonna go through a few slides on the geophysics. It's a very deep exploration project. So the geophysics was critical of what we were doing. I'll talk about our drilling. We drilled seven drill holes, very, very deep drill holes. And I'm not gonna discuss all of the data. We collected a lot of data on these drill cores. I'm gonna focus on the lithology and the geochronology. Today, I'm not discussing any geochemistry or any assay results, but it's worth noting that we did a lot of geochemistry analysis on these drill cores. They were continuously sampled with fusion geochemistry. So really, really high quality data for major and trace elements. We also put all of the drill holes through mineralized XRF scanning and we scan them with not one, but two different hyperspectral instruments. So lots of really fantastic data on those cores. We are relinquishing the Mount Isa South tenure. We're in the process of that at the moment, and we're gonna be handing all of the data over to the department. So that data will be available for future geological study. And then I'm gonna wrap up with a summary and what we're calling a very simplified geologic model based on seven drill holes in a really large area. So um, take that with a bit of a grain of salt, but we'll give you our view as to what we think is going on undercover there. In terms of where this project is located, I've got a couple of maps here. The first one is showing uh, the geological domains and you can see, I'll maybe get the laser pointer going again, if I can. There we go. So in this diagram here, you can see the extent of outcrop, Mount Isa outcrop and then the interpretation of the geological domains going undercover. And you can see where we drilled our seven drill holes for the Mount Isa South project, the MSD holes. On the other side here, the background is a regional gravity map and just showing you know, why we were interested in this, this tenure area. So the Mount Isa South tenure is the blue box here. It's a really massive area. It's approximately 7,300 square kilometers. So a really, really big um, area of tenure that we took out. And we were interested in this area because we thought that there could be extension of some of the very interesting Proterozoic Mount Isa rocks. I'm looking for a big Mount Isa style deposit under cover there. It's worth noting, it's not in today's presentation, but we have another exploration project that's still ongoing, our Diamond Cena project, where we've got nearly 4,000 square kilometers of tenure and we've just applied for quite a bit more. So we've really got some big land positions in the area here. The other diagram here, this is just um, a tomography map showing another reason why we were interested in this project just showing um, where you have this sort of change in um, properties is where you tend to have really big mineral deposits and potentially that might be continuing uh, further south undercover. Now I'm gonna present a little bit on some of the specific geophysics that, that we looked at before we picked up this tenure. So these were some slides that we prepared early on before we had our, our final tenure. This is showing uh, Aromag data first over um, the Mount Isa area, where you have some components of a mineral system that we think are quite important for making these, these big mineral deposits. You've obviously got metabasalts would potentially be a source of things like copper. 
and you've got SAG basins um, that could host reducing units um, where you could have good traps for concentrating big mineral deposits. And of course you have um, faults, which could be a pathway for fluids. And so looking, looking in the era mag data to the south undercover, we were trying to figure out where you could potentially, based on the early geophysics that we had, have similar features. And we picked up the Mount Isaac ground because you could see in the arrow mag that we thought that there were potentially metabasalts there and sag basins that could potentially host um, some reducing units that would be good targets for mineral deposits. We subsequently um, did quite a lot of geophysics over our 10 year area. Something I wanna point out first is um, we have all of these dots. The blue dots are actually governments MT survey points um, that was collected before we picked up the tenure. And something that attracted us to picking up this tenure was actually the government data that was collected. So just a bit of a note to say that we do look at that and it does lead to um, people picking up ground. So what we have in this diagram, we've got our tenure outline here and all of the dots um, are places where we had uh, geophysics data collected. The sort of lines going across are the MT MVS survey that we did. The blue would be the government data. And then the red is what we filled in. Now we didn't, um, we didn't, we didn't kind of send drunk people out in the field to have those lines going up and down. It's just worth noting that um, in that channel country there, the ground gets really difficult. And as some people are nodding their heads, it can be really difficult to actually get good locations. You also have some environmental constraints. And so we made those lines as straight as we could, but we obviously had some constraints um, going in and amongst the channels. But nevertheless, we're able to cover the whole tenure area in this MT data, which was a really important data set for us. What we also did over some areas that looked interesting um, is we collected some TEM data, which can be a bit more direct detection of sulfides. And those are some of the, the tighter space grids that you see in our tenure area. I've also put the locations of our seven drill holes on here. So in 2019, we drilled MSD001, MSD002, MSD003. And then in 2020, we drilled drill holes four, five, six, and seven. Prior to our drilling in this area, there was only one historic drill hole that just touched into some metamorphic rock, um, was drilled by a junior company. But what's really exciting about what I'm presenting here, which is the first time we have a public presentation on this and the data is it's gonna be handed into the department is um, this is really the first geological material that we have from this part of Mount Isa undercover. And I think um, hopefully there'll be people looking at it for years actually uh, using, using these samples, which were quite expensive to obtain, of course, with the deep drilling, to actually understand uh, the geology of the region. So I hope that there are people who look at these data sets. To look a little bit at the MT data, um, we combined our new sites with the previous work that was done by the geological survey to get complete coverage of our tidement areas. And the main objective, the main reason that we did MT is we wanted to look to see if we could find any Proterozoic siltstones or shales that might be good trap rocks for a big mineral deposit uh, based on what we were hypothesizing from what we saw in the initial Aramag data. It was um, also, we found it was really useful for actually figuring out the cover, the cover depth because that's something that wasn't very well constrained before we went in there, we tried to model it. So it was also useful for that. However, and this may be related to us relinquishing tenure, um, there was no evidence of any conductive proterozoic siltstone shale units within the resolution of the data. We also um, can look at our AMT, which is just the acoustic range of the MT. Um, comparisons, we actually, uh, we did some downhole geophysics. So we could look at the wireline res resistivity. And this was nice because this gives us confidence that our MT data is actually of, of good quality because in general, we had pretty good agreement with what we saw in the wire line down our drill holes. This is just one example from drill hole number three. And again, um, we didn't see any conductive proterozoic units. One thing to note is that there is a, a conductive marker at the base of the Cambrian on top of the proterozoic that we actually found was really useful for mapping that depth of cover. So that's something to know in the region. And when we got down into the proto-resoic rocks in the drill hole, there was resistive samite and amphibolite, which is again, consistent with what we had modeled from the MT. So we're confident based on the limited drilling we did that our MT is giving us pretty good results. Now I'm gonna move on to discussing the drill holes. And I've, I've put them all on one slide here to, to give you a view as to what we saw. And the lithologies that we have in our drill holes are similar to some of those that have been discussed in many of the Mount Isa talks. 
So just first to note with these lithology logs that I have here, I've got the drill holes going from one all the way to seven, seven's a small one down here. And I haven't plotted up all of the cover. They all have Aramanga and Georgina cover um, on top of them, but I thought you would probably be most interested in what the Proterozoic rocks are. So note that that blue at the top is just showing um, the depth of the cover and I've cut off quite a bit of the drill hole above that. And then what we're seeing underneath is what the basic lithologies are for the Proterozoic rocks. The lithologies, um, they're primarily bimodal volcanics, like you often see in the Mount Isa region. We get mafic volcanics, metabasalt, and a variety of felsic intrusives. There's also some gneisses and schists, some samites and some pegmatites. There is a little bit of metamorphism. So most of the things that we see in the drill hole are technically meta things, and it can be a little bit hard to see through it to see what the original lithology was. If I go through drill hole by drill hole, um, drill holes one and two have quite a few different lithology types. You can see quite a few different um, things in there, a lot of pegmatite intrusions, and um, a bit complicated actually mapping all those out, and I've even simplified them a little bit for this diagram. Drill hole three was a lot simpler. It mostly consisted of samite, and there was a little bit of interbited amphibolite. Drill hole four is mostly amphibolite toward the top of the hole, and then um, as you get down toward the bottom, you get alternating gneiss and felsic intrusions. Drill hole five was interesting. It was 100% metamorphic rocks, so metabasalts and some volcanic breaches. Really interesting drill hole that I think might be good to dig in academically. Um, that talk that we just saw in the Mafix would be quite interesting, but um, not quite what we were looking for for mineral deposit. Drill holes uh, six and seven were felsic intrusives, pretty uniform compositions. I thought I would show you a few pictures of some of our drill core, some of our rocks. And I do just have one slide on the cover rocks because although that's not what we were focusing on our efforts on, they're fascinating because they're full of fossils. They're absolutely full of trilobites, um, Cambrian trilobites in the Georgina. And we could get a bit distracted by them at times and our boss would have to remind us that we're looking for mineral deposits, not fossils. But um, we did partner with some paleontologists from the University of New England and we've actually donated some fossil samples to them. So they will be publishing some work on it and we'll continue to give them access to these. Really, really neat, um, really, really neat trilobites. That's a Zistradora. And it must be so rich in fossils down there because we've got these little drill holes. And so many times we would spear and you know, get a trilobite exactly centered in the drill hole. It must just be a sea of trilobites. Um, and in fact, if you look at this, this lower drill core here, this white unit is actually, it pretty much consists 100% of dead trilobite fossils stacked on top of each other. So we were calling that the trilobite death zone as we were logging. Uh, we also had some interesting agnostids, all sorts of weird and wonderful Cambrian creatures coming out of the drill core. If we get into the Proterozoic rocks, I've just grabbed some example core trays, but obviously, as you can see from the lithology logs, there's a lot of different rock types in there. So just an example from hole one of a pegmatite vein, hole two of a gneiss, hole three, a pretty typical samite, and then hole four, there's a metagranite. Then I've got two examples there of the metabasalt. Um, you do get a bit of carbonate alteration, some pyrite and some things in there, um, really, really, big thick units of metabasalt in that drill hole. Then um, from holes six and seven, the, the metagranite that you saw, and again, those two drill holes were pretty much just going into one big felsic intrusion. Now to actually figure out where we were in the stratigraphy, I'm not talking about geochemistry today, but we found it challenging to use geochemistry to actually pinpoint where we are, because as most of you in this room will know, the different super, super basins in Mount Isa can have very similar rock types. And if you're drilling undercover with no other context, it can be hard to know where you're sitting in the stratigraphy. So we found that geochronology was an essential tool to actually pinpoint where we were and the likelihood of, of being close to rock types we were interested in. So we did a lot of geochronology. And again, this is being released in Precambrian geology and I do hope that it's useful for integrating in with some other data sets. I'm not gonna go through all of the points in detail, there's a lot of them. I do have a couple of slides just highlighting some of the example geochronology results. But essentially what we found, um, the metasediment maximum depositional ages were the most useful for us for actually pinpointing where we were in the stratigraphy. 
And then we did also have some good results from some of the felsic rocks, but of course those are intrusions, so they can be younger. And so that's not always very definitive about where you sit. And we did attempt to get some results from some mafic rocks, but we found that really difficult. Um, it was really difficult to get good igneous zircons. There's, there's quite a few that we suspect would be um, metamorphic. So giving you some sort of information, but not really giving you an age. And we looked at retail and we looked at some other things, but the morphologies really weren't suitable for geochronology. So we didn't have much luck with that. The kind of big takeaway from the geochronology is that our interpretation is that all of the samples that we encountered um, are lower light part age or older. So you're sitting relatively far down in the stratigraphy. This is showing you just some example geochronology results. These are all of the maximum depositional ages from our meta sediments uh, going through the different drill holes, a nice summary diagram. And if you do a comparison, you look at the geochronology in the region, I'd say that they, you know, they look pretty similar to what you'd see in Mount Guide Quartzite, which is sitting in the lower Leichhardt Superbasin. So that's probably where we're sitting. Here's some example results. Again, I won't go through in detail for some of our felsic uh, meta igneous rocks. In general, we had pretty good luck with the geochronology, but because these rocks are protozoic, they're old, they're a bit metamorphosed, it was challenging. Um, we didn't always get great results even for felsic rocks that normally would be quite easy to date. And we took a stab at dating some of the pegmatites and had zero luck with that. They tend to have really high uranium concentrations and you pretty much don't get a good Concordia plot like you can see in this upper example here. That's pretty pretty terrible diagram to see when you're looking at geochronology, but we, but we gave it a try. And I think that um, this geochronology data set that we've produced is fantastic. It's giving us a really robust idea about the ages of these rocks. And we've uh, dated enough samples to be pretty sure about where we're sitting in the stratigraphy. We also did just to note, um, to aid with the interpretation, we did all the geochronology with, with Curtin University. Um, and we were sure to do petrology on all of the samples. So we were really sure what lithologies we were dating. I think that's really important. A lot of times you send samples off and you don't do petrology. I think it should be essential every time you send a geochron sample, you should do petrology. And then what they do at Curtin, which is neat, is they also, um, they'll often do TEMA scanning. So especially for the mafic rocks, that's really important. You can map out exactly um, where the potentially datable minerals are, how big they are, what, what their context is. And then of course you do the CL imaging as well to help you with the interpretation. So I think we've done a pretty good job, obviously with a lot of help from our academic colleagues. To summarize, I've pretty much already said this. Um, the geochronology for all seven drill holes with some variations is indicating that we're sitting pretty far down. The rocks are lower like our age are older. And if um, what we were looking for, the sort of big Mount Isa style deposit is known to be located much higher up in the stratigraphy sitting in the Urquhart shales. Now you could step back and say, well, how do we you know that maybe, you know, we're several hundred kilometers to the south Maybe in those basins to the south, there might be a reducing unit. Maybe there's a shell or something that you don't see further to the north. But combined with the geophysics we've done, the MT, where we don't see any evidence of that, um, we basically can rule out this area for hosting a big uh, Mount Isa style deposit based on the data that we have. I'm going to end with um, what we're calling a schematic or a simplified geologic map. I think we're being a bit brave here because we've only got seven drill holes in a really massive area. So maybe think of this as more of a cartoon. This is not our normal standard of geologic model, but we don't have a lot of information to work with here. So we've kept it really simple, um, but this is a very first pass view as to what the geology might look like under cover here. And I didn't point it out earlier, um, but if you go back to those lithology plots, you know, in some of our drill holes, there's over one kilometer of cover. So it's really deep. You know, some of those drill holes were only hitting the proto-rozoic rocks 800 meters or deeper than a kilometer. So this is simple, but nevertheless is giving us a first view as to what we might be seeing here. So if we, if we take a look, we've basically um, got in the blue, we've got our Georgina cover rocks, which is most of the drilling that we went through to just penetrate into the top of the Proterozoic. And then you've got our Amanga. And then we've got a few sections going across. We've got one here for drill holes four and five. We've got one going across the middle that has our one, two, and three drill holes. And then there's that historical by the junior company. And then one going across the bottom here. 
And again, we've kept it quite simple, but we've mapped out some places where we can see mafic volcanics. And then what we think is basement, and when we say basement, we mean that pre isa basement, so going underneath the Leichhardt. And then um, going, going into some sort of pre isa basin rocks as well. We also now um, can see from our drilling that some of the areas where we thought we might have a basin that might be hosting um, suitable shale rocks actually um, are, are felsic intrusions. So that's, that's the summary. That's all that I have. The view is to our geology. Again, I would just um, remind you that we've got massive data sets that we've collected in a very short period of time. We did just an immense amount of work in this tenure in two years. The team really put a lot of effort into it. And all of that information is going to be released to the department shortly. Thank you. Thank you so much. That's fascinating. We have one very quick question online. Uh, just wanting confirmation of which journal you're going to publish your geochronology in. Well, we've submitted it to Precambrian Geology. So if the reviews come back, then we'll hopefully publish it there. But it's in review at the moment. Thank you. Any one quick question from the floor or we'll move on? Yeah, great presentation. And um, thank you for adding actual physical knowledge to an area that we didn't know any much about. Um, I just missed what the age of the, um, the felsic intrusions were. Variable. So this is the summary of the geochronology. So you can look, the felsic rocks are sitting in sort of the hotter colors there. And you get some, some that are sort of like hard ages and some that are a little bit older. So you can, you can dive into the detail there. I'd be happy to chat about it with you later. One more quick one from online. Um, the, from Karen Connors, do you, you think the Mayfug volcanics are ECVs or are they older? They probably are ECVs. Um, it's actually really great to see the presentation earlier that now we have some geochem, because one of the challenges we had before some of this recent work was done is that there actually is surprisingly little modern quality geochemistry data for ECB available. Obviously the geochronology is quite limited as well. And we found it really hard to get geochron in that drill hole. So we weren't so confident from the geochron and we tried looking at the, the chemistry and it does seem to roughly match ECB. But one of the things I realized when I started doing data compilations is that there's kind of a lot of data concentrated right around Mount Isa mine, but not a lot of good regional data. So I wasn't quite sure if what I was looking at when I was comparing with literature at that time was somewhat anomalous because it was close to the mine. But having some of these broader data sets, I think, will help you with those correlations, you know, lacking any other context than just one drill hole. 